For at TV, the world is thinking. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I will start by a, 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 an anecdote from Richard Peters, who was a philosopher of education. And he made the point, he'd been talking to some uh, psychoanalysts, and he asked them what being rational meant. And they said that being rational means saying no to yourself. And saying no to yourself. And that's the sort of key thing I want you to just reflect on before we even begin. That if you're rational, you say no to yourself in various ways. You say, no, I won't do this. I'll wait. You say, no, I don't necessarily believe what you're saying is true. And you say, no, I'm not even sure what I believe is true. I'm going to check it out. So saying no to yourself is the basis of rationality. And when you think about academic freedom, lots of people say it's a complicated concept, and I don't think it is, because one way of looking at it is just to extend that saying no to yourself and saying academic freedom just means that in this place, normally the university, right, it's the place where we constantly say no to ourselves, which is where rationality holds sway, where nothing else in fact holds sway except the ability to reason and say no. Now, Anthony Arblaster, who was a famous writer, he wrote a Penguin special on academic freedom in 1970. I don't suppose anybody's read it apart from me, but you can buy it for 30p in any second-hand shop. <laughs> but it's, um, he points out that academic freedom is a pompous expression for freedom of expression in this place, in the university. It's just a pompous expression. And I think he's right about that. All it does mean is freedom of expression. And I won't make a distinction between freedom of speech and academic freedom. Because I see them essentially as a continuum. But if we're talking about this specific sort of speech, it means being rational, saying no to yourself, and actually engaging in debate. It's just that in the university, you can take that saying no to yourself much more further than you can in ordinary conversation. And Milton says that when you contradict somebody, it's the beginning of knowledge. And when you say no, you begin, knowledge begins. And in that conflict of opinion, and in the university, you can take it further, you can research. So people are always saying to me, I make a mistake of not seeing the difference between free speech and academic freedom, but I don't think there is one. That's my first claim. The second um, claim I'm going to make is that there aren't just many competing freedoms. There's not a paradoxical situation in which freedoms compete. Claire and I were at a conference in Kingston where people made this point. They had to weigh up one freedom, one right, with another freedom. But there's a hierarchy of freedom, freedoms, and Roy Harris, who helped me write the first, the FF statement, I wrote a very good article um, in defense of hate speech, where he made the point that freedom of speech comes first, it has a priority over all the freedoms, because if you don't have freedom of speech, you don't know what other people are thinking, and you can't test what you think by what they think or by what they say. And your whole um, ability to think for yourself is impeded, and you have a diminished society. So there is there are a hierarchy of freedoms, and freedom of speech is at the top of that hierarchy. Because you, without it, the whole concept of freedom itself is lost. Now, I was thinking as it came to prepare for the talk, why on earth anybody would be interested in academic freedom? Now, unless you're a professor or a university administrator, why on earth would you be interested in it? And there's a traditional defence which was always that the university was the embodiment of society's commitment to inquiry. Embodied, and the, the metaphor of the ivory tower I always like, because people always say you, know, you should get out of the ivory tower, but it, it's something that not only do academics look down from the ivory tower and it observes society, but society looks up to the ivory tower. And you can see people who stand for something, for your highest values, a total freedom of inquiry. Now, that sort of defence is, if you like, the traditional enlightenment defence of the university. That you, you put it as a place in society that's very special, and every civilised society would have such a place. Whereas now I think you've got to have a reverse defence of academic freedom if you're interested in it, and say that the we need the university to remind us of a lost value. When we don't value freedom of speech in society, it's useful to have academics there in the ivory tower to remind us. But unfortunately, <coughs> academics won't defend freedom of speech. They have very few defenders. And when we originally brought the AFAF statement out, everybody thought we would have thousands of people signing it, and they didn't. And in fact, the people who support you, we've got some very strange bedfellows. And we, 
it surprised me that quite a few relativists signed the statements of academic freedom. You can imagine why, because they just believe, well, why not let anybody say anything? Because nothing matters anymore, it's just anybody can say whatever the discourse was to tell them what the story they like. We also had um, you know, postmodernists who signed up for the same reason, and aristic people, and Steve Fuller being the classic one who spoke with Alex at the Battle of Ideas, who just thinks that arguing for arguing sake is great. So all you need to do is argue, doesn't matter what you argue about. Was. And um, finally, you get the usual bunch of eccentrics, you know, people who want to flat earthers of various sorts, or you know, racists and bigots, who's always the people we end up talking about, the extremists. And I think if you're defending freedom of speech, you've got to accept that they'll be there. And you argue with them, and it's um, something we just have to live with. It's that embarrassing it is at times. In fact, some of the people who won't support you are the people who do believe in um, abs you know, freedom of uh, absolute, uh, there is such a thing as knowledge and objective knowledge. Um, the Butterflies and Wheels people who um, run a website and uh, that largely attacks relativism in any fad are not very keen on objective freedom. In fact, um, criticise the FF position on that. So you do have you know, very few people who will actually um, defend freedom of speech. But you do have a lot of people attack it, and I just thought, just a little roundup, it just in, in Britain, um, Simon Davis woke up one morning to find himself attacked by um, Clark, the Secretary of State for Education, for criticising the government's policy of introducing identity cards, he threatened with the sack. They was t uh, Clark said he should have had the sack, but the LSE defended him where he works, actually, he gave him, I think, um, Four hundred thousand pounds to pursue more criticisms of government, which was unique um, at the university. And Edward Ernst at um, Exeter University, who's professor of alternative medicine, found himself on a disciplinary for two years because Prince Charles, his office, had phoned up and complained about his criticisms of alternative medicine. And then you get um, oh, constantly students and student unions. In Oxford recently, there was a campaign to get a professor um, sacked by students who thought that. Um, it, you haven't got a right to expend, express his views on the, um, migration, although in fact he is um, the world's expert on migration. And they argued that calling for him to be sacked was a good way of starting the debate, which is a curious <laughs> position for students. Because they couldn't use the usual arguments that he used, which is that he's not an expert in the subject. There's the cases in Leeds with Frank Ellis where he made racist comments, but he wasn't an expert in the area. But his name, where the, the professor at um, Oxford was the world's expert, so you have to have different reasons for getting rid of him. And of course, I was like the example of my own university where I could be sacked for blasphemy. Although the blasphemy laws have been repealed, we do have um, a limit on academic freedom which says any um, thing that brings the, you know, the religious ethos of the institution into dispute can be a dismissive offence. So we've got this, the state, um, the monarchy, the church, and trade unions and student unions all attacking freedom of speech. So there is a, a constant attack. And just as last week, the um, director of research at the Higher Education Academy was threatened with the sack for writing outrageously a letter to the Times uh, Higher Education magazine saying that the statistics used in the student surveys were very um, satisfactory and made some criticism. He was suspended because he didn't get approval for his letter before he sent it. And the HEA is the defender of um, academic values in the British system. It's a sort of professional association. So we have few friends and quite a few enemies of academic freedom. But what you really don't get, I think, or anybody who really defends it, and constantly at, at discussions organised by the Manifesto Club, the Institute of Ideas, and just generally in universities, you always find that people will say, I'm in favour of academic freedom. You won't find anybody who said I'm against it, I don't think. But they'll then use the word but. So we move from no to but. And the butters <coughs> are always there. They will, they will say, I believe in academic freedom, absolutely, but. And you can count the buts, they're so obvious where the buts are. We're not going to have any, we can have academic freedom, but not for fascists. Academic freedom, but not for Zionists. Academic freedom, but not for Semites. And academic freedom, but not for climate change deniers, academic freedom, but not for homophobes. And it goes on and on and on. There are so many buts now that there are not many people who will really defend it. And you can get the most banal um, arguments. At one university where I made a, little, a short speech about academic freedom, somebody said to me, it's really difficult to do this because I don't want to go to the pub 
and have somebody saying offensive racist remarks. And there's that sort of view that, you know, I don't want ever to be bothered, I don't want to argue. Listening to somebody in um, a New York um, bar the other day, there's a couple discussing religion with two friends, and they said at the end of it, I normally don't say anything like this. I would normally make any comment about my beliefs as I left, so I didn't get involved in any debate. And there's a sort of general fear of debate, even in, um, even in New York, where people argue and talk a lot. But I do think that, you know, that the real problem is that people are much more reluctant now, for lots of reasons, to speak up and say anything. And the reason we took this magic word of being offensive was always still the key test now. To me, it's the litmus paper test, which is why I put it in the AFAS statement, which took ages to design. And it is always the reason why people will not support it. Because they'll say, I'm, I'm in favour of academic freedom as long as it doesn't go too far. But of course, so many people are now offended. And if you take the, the people, I'm in favour of academic freedom, but not for students, because students are in a different category, or, but not for a whole range of people, because students are not. If one university, think and make it up, said that students shouldn't be exposed to critical views until their third year of an undergraduate course because they weren't capable of taking it. So the real def the defense you have of, I know, wind up because Alan's looking at me, but negative, <laughs> the, there was always people make a distinction between negative and positive freedom. And I think the great thing about a university, or if it's going to start, it should be a model of negative freedom. And it really is important that in a university you hear and say lots of things, but nobody tells you what to think. And if you're in a situation where many universities, certainly in Britain, where prescribed views every member of staff has to sign up to, for instance, you've got sports, diversity policies, multiculturalism, as a condition of being employed, then these are, I would say, pre-modern universities. The universities where people are being told what to think, rather than being exposed to lots of different views, and learning to think for themselves. So you make a choice that if you're moving towards a pre-modern view of a university where you learn what you shouldn't think or what's right to think, then it's not, to my mind, anything that, that should be called a university. But there is a ray of hope. And the, the thing about all these groups that people say will be offended, whether they're, they're students, or whether they're Zionists, whether they're um, racists, whether they're just complete uh, extremists of all sorts, they, their views can be expressed. And you find that students are very open to their, their views. And in, we just had a campaign at East Anglia <coughs> University, Warwick University, and Bath University have all voted to overturn no platform policies. Because what they've said is, it doesn't matter how extreme your views are, we want to be able to decide. There's been a major campaign written by the NUS to try and combat what they see as the, the AFAF campaign right, to get rid of no platform policies. Actually, the campaign consists of one person, right, essentially, and a few people who've taken up um, the ideas, but they won't be told what to think. In fact, some students said to the students' union, you're the fascists, are telling us what we've got to think and what we can hear to speak. So, I think you should be allowed to hear any voice, no matter how evil it is in the university. And if you remember the old, um, uh, sorry, the old statement that I started with about saying no, you know, is a good condition of rationality. So I think if we start to say no to anybody who wants to stop any freedom of speech, then you take the first step towards actually rebuilding a rational society. because. We're, the more restrictions you put on what people say, the more you say they're not rational. Because essentially you're saying to all those people, all the students, anybody who would be offended, that they're not really rational human beings. And that is the important <coughs> thing. It's not a matter of saying to any fascist, anti-Semite, Zionist, you, you know, we want to encourage your views. We want to let your views be heard so they can be challenged. Claire made an excellent point at one um, um, talk she gave and said that if you want to defeat arguments, you've at least got to let them be heard. If you're going to defeat it, you've got to hear it. And I think that's the message we've got to say. And not say free speech, but, but just say no to anybody who wants to stop us having total and absolute free speech.